Hello everyone and welcome to our module on sarcoidosis. So sarcoidosis is a granulomatous disease and there are a number of granulomatous diseases and the two most important ones you should know as a medical student are sarcoid and tuberculosis. And in granulomatous diseases, granulomas form in many places in the body. Granulomas are a special kind of inflammation made up mostly of macrophages. We'll talk about that in a minute. Sarcoidosis is an immune mediated process, so the immune system plays an important role. We'll talk more about that in a minute. And it has an unknown cause. We don't know what triggers this condition to start in patients. The hallmark of sarcoidosis is a non-caseating granulomata. So what does that mean? Well, decades ago when pathologists looked at the infected tissue of patients with granulomatous diseases, they found that some of the granulomas had this yellowy cheese-like stuff in them, and they called those caseating granulomas. And that's what you see in tuberculosis. In contrast to that, in patients who have sarcoidosis, what you see are non caseating granulomas. They don't have that cheese-like necrotic tissue in the middle of them. Really, caseating or non-caseating is a description of the gross appearance in sarcoidosis. It's not a description of the histologic appearance, although it's often used to mean that because in patients with sarcoidosis, you don't see necrotic tissue, which is what you do see in TB. So what makes up these non-caseating granulomas? Well, it's got a tightly packed central area, and I've shown this down here in this picture, I'm drawing a circle around it with my pen right now. And inside this area, there are lots of macrophages and epithelioid cells, and then also multinucleated giant cells, which are special cells found in granulomas. And then around the periphery here, where I'm drawing with my pen right now, is lymphocytes and monocytes and mast cells and fibroblasts. The most important thing to notice about this picture right here is that there is not a lot of dead tissue here in the center. If there were lots of dead tissue and no nuclei, that would be a caseating granuloma like you see in TB. In this example here, there are cells and nuclei that are packed together without a lot of necrotic tissue, and that means it's non-caseating. And generally, non-caseating, especially in board questions, means sarcoidosis, whereas caseating means TB. So what's going on at a cellular level that leads to the formation of these granulomas and sarcoidosis? Well, the first thing to know is that this is a cell-mediated immune process. So antibodies and complement and all that stuff doesn't play an important role in sarcoidosis. At the cellular level, this process starts by accumulation of Th1 CD4 helper T cells, and it's high yield to remember that. A lot of the data on sarcoidosis comes from lavaging the alveoli in the lungs of patients who have sarcoidosis. And when they do that and they analyze the cell types, they find that there's a very high ratio of CD4 to CD8 cells. And this is different from the periphery where the ratio is usually more equal or higher for CD8. But in the lungs of these patients, you see a high concentration of these CD4 cells, and that's how we know they're important. These cells secrete IL-2 and interferon gamma. Those are very important chemical mediators. The IL-2 stimulates T cell proliferation and the interferon gamma activates macrophages. Ultimately, all this leads to granuloma formation. So if you're not gonna be a basic science researcher and you just kinda of wanna know what you need to know about this process at a basic level, just remember that the CD4 T cells are important and that IL-2 and interferon gamma are also very important. So as I said in the beginning, in sarcoidosis, granulomas form all over the body. But let's talk about some of the specific problems patients with sarcoidosis develop. The lungs are the most common site of organ involvement, and that's why we're discussing this in the pulmonary modules. And I'll talk more about lung sarcoid in a minute. You can also get involvement of the skin and the eye. I'll talk more about those in detail in a minute. Sarcoid can sometimes involve the heart, and the granulomas can block the conduction of electrical activity, and this can lead to heart block. So these patients can present with bradycardia, and syncope and signs of AV dissociation and heart block on their EKG. Patients with sarcoid also sometimes develop a cardiomyopathy. Many other systems are rarely involved. So sarcoid's been described just about everywhere. As I said down here, any system can be involved. Some that are worth knowing is that the kidneys can get involved and patients with sarcoid sometimes develop renal failure. And then the central nervous system sometimes gets involved. We call that neurosarcoid. And two sort of classic findings in patients with neurosarcoid, even though it's rare overall, are to develop a Bell's palsy, which is a facial nerve palsy where you get droop on one half of the face, or to develop motor loss. So if you have weakness in a lower extremity or an arm, that's related to a granuloma forming and disrupting that nerve circuit. It's very important you know two classic things about the lung involvement in sarcoid. The first is that hilar lymphadenopathy is a classic finding. So in this chest x-ray down here, 
I'm circling the hilar lymph nodes with my pen. They are enlarged and bright white in this chest x-ray, and that's hilar lymphadenopathy. You can also see that with tuberculosis, but it's classic for sarcoid. And then the classic symptom is to have cough and dyspnea. Sarcoid can also cause other lung findings like infiltrates that look sort of like pneumonia, and it can also lead to pulmonary fibrosis. But these are the two things you definitely need to make sure you know about the hilar lymphadenopathy and the cough and dyspnea. The skin gets involved in sarcoid, and there are many lesions that are possible. So if you look up the literature on this, you'll see that patients with sarcoid have been found to have plaques and macular papules and subcutaneous nodules. But the classic sarcoid lesion you should know for your boards is erythema nodosum. And this is a picture of it down here on the right. It's these red splotches, usually on the shins, that are inflamed and painful. It's inflammation of fat cells under the skin from granulomas. And they're tender, and they're usually on both shins. And this is a pretty classic example down here on the right. So just like with the skin, involvement of the eye in sarcoid can involve many parts and lots of different things have been reported, but the classic finding in the eye to know about is uveitis. So let's review what the uvea is. It's the iris, the ciliary body, and the choroid. I'm drawing black markings through it here with my pen. It's the inner vascular layer, the eye, that goes from the back all the way around to the front. And when you get uveitis, you can either have anterior uveitis, where the iris and the ciliary body are primarily involved, or the posterior uvea can be inflamed where you have the choroid involved. Usually patients with sarcoid who get uveitis have mild symptoms like dry eyes or blurry vision, and in fact a lot of times it's just picked up on routine exam. Ophthalmologists can see evidence of uveitis when they look in the back of the eye sometimes. Other sarcoidosis features that it's high yield for you to know, especially for step one, are hypercalcemia. So the alveolar macrophages that are activated in sarcoid can increase their production of 1-alpha-hydroxylase activity. So let's look down here at this reaction. 1-alpha-hydroxylase, you'll recall, catalyzes the conversion of 25 vitamin D to 125, the active form of vitamin D, and this will lead to increased levels of calcium in the blood. Another finding in sarcoid is high ACE levels. So recall that ACE is produced in the lungs, and many lung diseases will increase the ACE levels, but it's classic for it to be elevated in sarcoid. This is technically a nonspecific finding because, as I said before, many lung diseases have high ACE levels, but you should know that in sarcoid the level will go up because there's inflammation in the lungs. So what's the classic presentation of sarcoid you should know for your boards? Well, first of all, it's going to be an African-American female, usually a younger patient in their 30s or 40s. This is the most common demographic, although in actual practice, you'll see sarcoid in a wide range of patients. There'll be hilar lymphadenopathy on the chest x-ray. The symptoms will be cough and dyspnea. And then one other presentation you're sometimes shown is someone who's asymptomatic and has a routine chest x-ray showing hilar lymphadenopathy. This is another sort of common way for the condition to be picked up. Finally, let's talk about the treatment for sarcoidosis. So the first line therapy is corticosteroids, and this is usually pretty effective in knocking down the symptoms of the disease. The problem is that long-term administration of steroids is associated with weight gain and diabetes and osteoporosis. So generally, you try to convert patients to another immunosuppressant, drugs like methotrexate or azathioprine or mycophenolate. And these are sometimes called steroid-sparing agents because they are alternatives to corticosteroids. And that concludes our module on sarcoidosis.